Hi, Meadowood Ward family. This is Bishop Gerstner here in self-isolation. I um, can not hardly believe all the events of the past couple weeks. It's been, it seems like it's been such a long time since we've been able to gather together as a ward. And as individuals, we need that um, connection with each other, especially in a ward family. And missing that connection is something very significant. And so I thought it would be a fun opportunity for us to try and maintain that connection through some innovative ways um, by using technology to reach out and connect with each other. In our Come Follow Me study this week, uh, we're learning about the allegory of the olive tree and for me, that's always been uh, a chapter that has been interesting to read um, and unique simply because it's the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon. We have um, an expert in our ward, Bishop Paul Hoskison, who um, has a lot of experience with this chapter in the Book of Mormon and has several meaningful and unique insights that he can share with us. And I asked him to spend a few moments talking about the allegory of the olive tree. And I would like to share that with you and encourage each of you to uh, watch this video that uh, Bishop Hoskison has made and to um, hopefully, uh, that this video will hopefully enhance your um, study of Jacob chapter 5 and that after hearing Bishop Hoskison and reading that chapter that uh, this will have new meaning for you and that it will also be a touch point and a connection for you to feel a part of our ward family. And at this time I just uh, bless each of you that you will um, continue to draw near unto the Lord and he has promised to draw near to you. And I hope that you feel that closeness even in an era of social distancing. Well, it's nice to be with our word members again. It just seems like an eternity since we've been together. I've been asked to uh, uh, do a little um, substitute Sunday school class on the olive tree, the allegory of the olive tree in Jacob chapter 5. I wanted to start though by saying how I got involved in, in the allegory of the olive tree many years ago. In fact, about 50 years ago this month is when I first thought seriously about the allegory of the olive tree. I was uh, living in kibbutz in a little two-man shack and it was Sabbath day and I was resting on the Sabbath day, laying on my bed, reading my Book of Mormon, and I had come to uh, Jacob chapter 5, and I started reading it. And, and I glanced across the room and out the window, and there was an olive tree. And I thought, this is cool. I'm going to watch the olive trees here in Israel while I'm here. <clears throat> and I did. I paid a lot of attention. I learned a lot about olive tree culture and about the land uh, of Israel and that part of the world. So we want to start though, uh, talking about the allegory, by turning to Jacob chapter 4, uh, verse 15, because this is the introduction to the allegory of the olive tree. And now I, Jacob, am led on by the Spirit unto prophesying, for I perceive by the workings of the Spirit which is in me, that by the stumbling of the Jews they will reject the stone upon which they might build and have safe foundation. The stone is one of those metaphors that's used in the Old Testament to, uh, um, to describe Christ. Uh, for example, in Isaiah 26, verse 16. So uh, Jacob is prophesying here that the, the Jews will reject Christ. <clears throat> and then in verse 16, But behold, according to the scriptures, this stone, that is Christ, shall become the great and the last and the only sure foundation upon which the Jews can build, and I would add here, for their own salvation. And now, my beloved, how is it possible that these, the, the Jews, 
after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it that it may become the head of their corner? Well, the answer is the allegory of the olive tree. That's how they're going to do it. The olive tree itself uh, was originally, the allegory of the olive tree was originally given by uh, Zenos, uh, probably recorded in the Old Testament, and Jacob is copying it from the Old Testament into, onto his plates. We don't know anything about Zenos except that he's mentioned uh, twice, I believe, in the Book of Mormon. But he's giving this allegory of the olive tree, and apparently the allegory was quite well known in the ancient world because in Romans chapter 11 in the New Testament, um, Paul refers to the uh, olive trees and the wild and the tame branches. So the concept of an olive tree and an allegory of the olive tree was alive and well in Old Testament times going on into the New Testament. It's unfortunate that we don't have the original though of Zenos. So, what, how is this going to be answered? How can the Jews build on Christ when they have rejected him? The answer is going to be in the history of the house of Israel. So Jacob chapter 5 is a history of the house of Israel and woven throughout the text is the story of how the Jews can build on Christ once they have rejected him. Let us <clears throat> talk a little bit about some of the symbolism in the uh, uh, allegory of the olive tree. Uh, the olive tree itself of course represents the house of Israel, the vineyard represents the world, the decay in the olive tree represents apostasy, the pruning uh, represents cleansing of the house of Israel. The roots, as I understand it, uh, refer to the gospel, including all of the covenants and ordinances that belong to it. The fruit, of course, are the lives of the house of Israel, of the saints. The mother tree is the house of Israel as it's constituted in the land of Israel. And the transplanted trees are the different scatterings of the house of Israel throughout most of the world. There are seven parts to the allegory of the olive tree, as I'm going to explain it. Uh, you would expect seven, because seven is the number that represents uh, the totality, all that there is, and therefore it's nice that Zenos divides it up into seven sections. Let's begin uh, going through, and I'm going to give you a quick definition of the <clears throat> rundown of the seven parts of the allegory of the olive tree, and then we'll come back and talk about some of the elements in there. Uh, verse 3, uh, Jacob chapter 5, verse 3, is the, the first segment of the allegory of the olive tree. And, and simply it says that uh, there is a house of Israel, it grew old, and it began to decay. So already in the first verse we have a, a lot of time that has taken place, and the, the house of Israel has been founded, it has grown, it has flourished, and it's gone into decay, that is, into apostasy. And then in verse 2, we get the second uh, uh, element, that is, uh, sorry, uh, verse 4 through 14 uh, is uh, the history of the scattering of the house of Israel. And that happens about between 900 and 600 uh, BC. The third section is chapter, uh, verses 15 through 28, and that is talking about the Christianity as it was developed in the land of Israel and probably also here in the New World among the Israelites here. Verses 29 through 49 talk about the apostasy that occurred uh, among the early Christians both here and in the New World, both in the New World and the Old World. Yeah, verses 50 through 74 talk about the gathering of Israel in the latter days. Then verses 74 and 75 and 76 describe the millennium after Christ has come the second time. And then verse 77 we have that short period after the millennium that uh, ends up, that, that it talks about the end of the world as we know it. But let's go back and talk about some of the elements in here. <clears throat> First of all, whoever wrote it really knew about olive trees. This is could not have been Joseph Smith. As I observed the, the horticulture of olive trees in Israel, I was just astonished at how close this allegory comes to the, exactly the way that they take care of the olive trees in Israel. The first thing that I noticed, um, there was a huge olive grove between where I was assigned to work on the kibbutz and the kibbutz itself, and it was run by Palestinians. And while I was there, 50 years ago, they went through that orchard 
at Olive Orchard and pruned it. They didn't use anything smaller than a chainsaw to prune the orchard. In fact, I noticed they cut off everything on every tree that was any smaller than about that size. The reason for that is that the olives, grows on, olives grow on the new growth of a tree and not on the old growth. So you want to uh, cut off the old growth and stimulate it to make new branches that will then produce the olives. Also, how you take care of a tree is quite different in Israel than you would think growing up in New York State. Uh, they never water the olive trees in Israel, the, the natural ones, that is. <clears throat> On the kibbutz where I was, they began to raise some hybrid olive trees, and they did water those. But the native olive trees, they never watered them. They get plenty of water, even in the dry season, to be able to produce the olives. Also, they dug around them a lot. I was surprised. They ran a disc harrow through all of the orchards, the olive orchards there. In, you never see that here in the States with a nice fruit tree uh, orchard because it destroys the roots growing close to the surface. And unlike um, here in the States, you hardly ever fertilize mature fruit trees. You do when they're little to get them to grow some wood and to grow strong, but you don't really want to fertilize them very much when they're mature and, and begin to produce some fruit because the fertilizer will tend, will tend to have the tree produce more wood and not fruit. Well, in Israel, they did. They fertilized all the olive trees all the time. So whoever wrote the olive tree allegory to begin with, Zenus or somebody else, uh, knew olive tree horticulture from observance. Let's talk about some of the uh, features in here. The grafting in of the wild olive branches is really contrary to what you would think because normally you graft in the kind of fruit that you want to get rather than something wild. And that's brought out in Romans chapter 11 where Paul is talking to the Gentiles saying, look, you are wild olive branches and you've been grafted into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, be careful because if God didn't spare the natural branches, he's certainly not going to spare the wild ones that have been grafted into the olive tree. So that's one important thing is that it's against the, the usual practice to graft in wild branches into a tame olive tree. But it works in this case as Paul says in Romans chapter 11. And uh, I think there's a lesson here and that is Christ can heal anyone, whether you're Jew or Gentile or whatever you are. Everyone has a chance if they're grafted into the tree and they take. All of us can bring forth good fruit, no matter where we come from. It's interesting to note that um, it, it, uh, the ground in the allegory of the olive tree is described in different ways. The mother tree, of course, the ground there is never described that well, so we're not sure what it was like. But if you've ever been to Israel, you know it was bad land. A lot of it was bad land. Olive trees don't require a lot, and so most of the native, the natural olive trees, that is the, the older ones, uh, that have been there for a couple of hundred years. And by the way, there are olive trees in Israel that are about 2,000 years old. <clears throat> and they still produce good olives if they're taken care of the way they're described in the allegory of the olive tree. But the olive trees are usually planted in the worst parts of the land because they don't require very much. They don't require watering. Uh, all you got to do is dig around them a little bit and fertilize them and that's about and prune them with a chainsaw. And that's all you really have to do to an olive tree. They save the good ground for the fruits and the vegetables and the grains and other kinds of, uh, of natural fruit trees. On uh, the kibbutz where I lived, we grew uh, apples and peaches mostly. And uh, the orchards there were very rich and fertile, the ground. But olive trees can live in the worst place in the land of Israel and they will thrive there. If they uh, grow the, uh, the, uh, the usual olive trees in the worst plots of the land in Israel, and the way it's described in the Book of Mormon, the four uh, 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 transplants that are mentioned in the allegory of the olive tree, the first one says it was the worst spot on the ground, and the second one said it was worse than that, the third one says it was really bad, and the fourth one says it was beautiful and grand and great there the, in the fourth one. Um, what this tells me is that it, it's not the ground that you live on 
that makes you produce good fruit. It's how you behave when you're attached to the olive tree. Are you bringing forth good fruit? Because it doesn't matter what the ground is like that the tree is in. It's you that make the difference in there. Now, there's some things that you have to do to produce good olives. Of course, the one of them is the pruning that they talked about. You have to cut off the bad branches. Most olives, that I'm aware of anyway, when you pick them off the tree, are totally unedible. You can't eat them, they're way too sour and bitter. And you have to cure them to get the bitterness out. But their wild olives, you can't get the bitterness out, and so they really are nasty. Uh, and that's why you'd want to take care of the olive tree, is to get the, the bitter olives that are still really good once they're cured. I think that's partly true in our cases. A lot of us need some curing before we can become good in the house of God. Also, uh, grafting is very important with olive trees, as it is with a lot of different kind of fruit trees. And olives take particularly well, apparently, to grafting. Uh, a good friend of mine, some of you know Jack Welch, uh, grew up in Southern California and read the allegory of the olive tree and thought, well, if this is true what it's talking about, I'm going to find out. So he cut off an olive branch in his backyard and went over to another spot and stuck the branch in the ground. And sure enough, it grew. Olive trees are like that. They're very hardy. There are some things in here that I think are important that we need to talk about. One of them is, the Lord says in, in, <clears throat> in uh, verse 41, after he's gone around and inspected during the apostasy period, that's verses 29 through 49, um, that all of the trees during the apostasy period had produced bad fruit. There was no good fruit on any of the trees in that time period, contrary to the period prior to that one, which is the period of Christianity, when all of the olive trees produced good fruit. During the apostasy, <clears throat> the Lord took care of the olives like he would, um, uh, like, like they were, uh, like you're supposed to take care of them. But then he says, after he goes around and inspects all of the olive trees in that fifth, fourth period, the apostasy period, He's, they're all bad, and he says in verse 41, What could I have done more for my vineyard? He had pruned them, he had dug around them, he had fertilized them, uh, he had taken care of all of their needs, and yet they produced bad fruit. In verse 47, he talks about that again. But what could I have done more in my vineyard? Of course, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is nothing. He did everything he could. He doesn't always have control. He does not uh, abridge our agency. He lets us do what we want. And the olive trees apparently did. He says, uh, again in verse 47, Have I slackened my hand that I have not nourished it? Nay, I have nourished it, and I have digged about it, and I have pruned it, and I have dunged it, and I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long, and the end draweth nigh. And he doesn't want to lose it. And, so they decide, he and the uh, servant of the Lord of the vineyard decide they're going to try one more time, one last time, to try and take care of the olive orchard, or the olive trees. Uh, let's go to verse 74, because they labor a long time, in verse 74, and thus they labored with all diligence according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard, even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard. And the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. So they did, they were successful in that uh, sixth period, uh, that is, uh, from uh, uh, taking care of the apostasy and moving up to this period when there, uh, it says in here, and they became the natural fruit and they became like unto one body and the fruits were equal and the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit which was most precious unto him from the beginning. And there was no more corruption throughout his olive groves. To me, that says this is the millennium when there was no, when there is not going to be any evil, no bad, no apostasy during the millennium. And then to wind it all up, after the millennium, uh, a good time has passed away, in verse 77, we get the end of the world. And when the time cometh that evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, 
Then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered, and the good will I preserve unto myself, and the bad I will cast away into its own place. And then cometh the season and the end, and my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire. So the end of it all is the earth will be cleansed, or at least after the millennium, uh, that short period after the millennium when the devil will be loosed again. The earth will be eventually cleansed. And who knows what's going to happen to it after that. We're told that the celestial kingdom will be here on this earth too, so it's got to be cleansed and fixed up somehow for the, for the um, celestial kingdom. Now, there are some other things that we can learn also from the allegory of the olive tree. One of them is the patience that the Lord has with all of us. He loved that tree and he did all that he could in his power to keep the tree producing good fruit. I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, is there anything the Lord has not done for us that he still needs to do for us to produce good fruit? Has he taken care of us? Has he loved us? Has he pruned us? Some of us don't like pruning, it hurts. And have we brought forth good fruit in the orchard? One of the things that gives me great consolation is that I'm still in the church, which means I'm still in the tree. And as long as you are still in the tree, there's a good chance that you'll produce good fruit going forth. It's when we're not in the tree anymore that we stop any chance of producing good fruit. It's a beautiful allegory. I love it. I love the idea of the olives there in Israel. One of the advantages there when I lived in Israel was that uh, the, the olive orchard that, that I mentioned at the beginning belonged to the kibbutz that I lived on, but the kibbutzniks didn't want to take care of it. So they leased it to the Palestinians who lived in a village nearby. And the Palestinians took care of the orchard, the olive trees, and harvested them. And in payment for their use of the olive trees, they gave uh, cured olives to the kibbutz. So every meal on the kibbutz in the communal kitchen, we had olives from our own olive trees. And I learned to love green olives while I was there. A good olive tree is well worth preserving and taking care of, just as we are worth it. It's been nice to talk about the allegory of the olive, olive tree. I'm grateful for this invitation to do it. I know the Book of Mormon is true. It was not written by Joseph Smith or anyone else in the 19th century. It's an ancient text, and it's full of gospel truths. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I do look forward to the time when we can meet again in the chapel and in our classes. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>